Well, good afternoon, first of all. I have to congratulate you because you managed to keep awake and it's almost four o'clock, three presentations. Oof, it's, it's quite a task to listen to people and to arguments and to go back and forth. Um, so this is the last presentation and I hope you'll enjoy it. I will try to bring in, in this presentation, uh, the position of both the opponents, the proponents, explain why they think as they do, what is happening behind the arguments, and then uh, try to set out the case for it uh, that is in front of us. So that's my task. You see the title on, uh, on the screen, uh, A Thorn of Humility and in the Adventist Flesh. So let me explain the title in the introduction. Now, I'm probably standing here because um, of a couple of reasons. One is that I was part of the Theology of Ordination Study Committee that met at the GC uh, between uh, January 2012 and uh, uh, June 2014, uh, four times. So that's probably one of the reasons. And the other one is that um, in 2002, I began to work on the topic of ordination of women uh, on a doctoral level uh, here in England. And I looked into the arguments of both camps. And I tried to do a justice to both camps, looking into how they reason, what texts they use, and why they use these texts, and why they differ. And so what I discovered, I tried to uh, publish in a book, which is called uh, Ordination of Women in Islam and this Theology, a study in biblical interpretations. So this is uh, the kind of most comprehensive summary, if you want, of all the arguments presented before 2012. When TOSC happened in 2012, the arguments have moved on so much. I have to tell you, and I, I'm guessing not all of you are up to speed with what's happening actually now with the arguments. So I will try to give a good justice to both sides um, this afternoon and to present the latest uh, cutting edge arguments uh, comprehensively and systematically. Um, so that's the first point. Now, over the years since I studied this subject of ordination of women, I discovered that uh, it's, a, it's an interesting study where you can begin to read on what people say, how they read the scripture, and it's a kind of window which is opening your view into what's happening in people's thinking, and why they interpret scripture as they do. But uh, since Tosk happened, and I have to say that Tosk has tried to clarify the issues, and it did clarify the positions of the both uh, camps, but still did not address some pressing hermeneutical uh, matters, and so the divisions remained. And this is uh, where we are today in the church. Um, the church basically has agreed to disagree on this matter since June 2014. And uh, all this means that recently I have changed my mind on the ordination of women, meaning I don't see it just a window, a study case into how we Adventists think about Scripture, how we interpret Scripture, but I see now the ordination as a thorn. In fact, a thorn of humility. Um, here is my text, or the, the text that I will use as as the starting point for my discussion. I hope it's coming up, yes. This is from Paul. Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Since 1881, as it was mentioned in the previous presentation, when the question of ordination of women was first time raised at the general conference level, we seem to have a big problem um, with this topic and how to solve this topic. The General Conference in session in 2010 
has laid down a worldwide roadmap for solving this painful thorn of disunity. The church said, we're going to involve all division fields. So they involved 13 divisional research committees, bringing in the best people, the best scholarship to try to get to the bottom of this. And the GC itself said, we're going to provide our own steering committee to the whole process, called the Theology of Ordination Study Committee, which met four times, as I said um, to you. And so the administration, the leadership of the church, wants a solution to this topic. And they said, we want to have some sort of solution by 2015 and uh, the GC that's coming up. So how do we then begin to make sense out of what's going on? And uh, can we establish if there is a solution to this wound of disunity that is hurting us like a thorn, like a weakness? In my presentation, I will try to address the ordination debate from both angles. I know some of you have been crying this morning and afternoon saying our side was not quite represented. So I'll try to do justice to it. And uh, I will discuss also the options open to us, coming from both sides. So this is the outline. Um, you should see it on the screen. Um, you can see it there. In the first part, in the first part I will introduce the angle of uh, opponents of women's ordination outlining, as you can see, um, the uh, theological case, use of texts, and their thinking, why they think as they do. And the same thing with the proponents, their theological case, the use of texts, and their thinking. And then in part three, the future of the debate, sorry, you can't see it very well, um, and then the administrative opportunities or options and their implications. And lastly, this is something about uh, Martin Luther, the lesson of Martin Luther, Swingley, and Adventists. That's an interesting one, watch out for that one. Uh, my main argument, let me lay it down straight away, my main argument at the end of the paper will be that the debate is over. The TOSC, Theology of Ordination Study Committee, has demonstrated that we don't have and will not have in any foreseeable future, theological unity on this issue, on this matter. And, and hence, we essentially, for the time being, have agreed to disagree. The GC has recognized this trend, this trend, I should say, and hence the question before the GC delegates, as, as you heard this morning, and I will um, bring it up again, the question before the GC delegates this July is an administrative question. It's not a theological question, what they think about ordination. The question I would put to you is a question of trust, humility, and not theology. So this is my premise. Let's go into part one, the thinking of the opponents of women's ordination. Firstly, I will describe the position of uh, opponents, and I will illustrate their case, their approach to texts, and their, their thinking. So. As I said to you, this is the kind of gleaned systematic summary in five points. I will not bother you with many details, but key five key points which makes their theological case tick. Okay? Um, number one, point number one. Okay, uh, yes. I'll just, sorry, let me start again. Okay, this is where I want to be. First, the three fundamental reasons of opponent's case. Now, by the way, this is gleaned from their latest documents, uh, the TOSC documents that are available online, even though I have slightly bigger versions than probably that are online, but you can go online. I'll show you the web page at the end where you can go and find these summary presentations. So what I'm doing, I'm gleaning um, the summary uh, from their own papers. So the three fundamental reasons of opponent's case. Um, they say there are three vital reasons for the position we hold. First, the Bible seems quite clear on the matter of ordination of women. Second, we believe that we should continue to have the Bible as our supreme authority in all matters of faith and practice. Third, if we are influenced by culture or depart from a biblical basis of our practice in this area, we are more likely to depart from scripture in other areas. Some of it was mentioned, 
but this is a systematic presentation. Point number one, uh, the Bible is clear on the matter of ordination. Um, the Bible clearly says, they say, that the elder must be the husband of one wife. This instruction was given in two different settings, 1 Timothy 3 and uh, Titus 1.6. So it cannot just be a response to, they say, local problem that is not applicable elsewhere. Rather, it is instruction for the church at large for all times. Furthermore, 1 Timothy, in 1 Timothy, this specification occurs just five verses after instruction restricting women from certain teaching authority in a church, that they should be silent. Uh, since the church leader, um, since the church leader described in 3.1 must be, must be also able to teach, the, the, uh, the, the opponents infer, the prohibition and the requirement seems to be related. Paul restricts the leadership of women in the church on the basis of Adam's priority in creation, as well as the respective roles of Adam and Eve before and after the fall. This is from uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse uh, 13, 14. This grounding of his instruction in Genesis, um, in the early chapters of Genesis, indicates that the matter relates to God's original plan for human beings and is not just his response to the sin problem. This is a key uh, theological statement uh, by opponents, of course. There is something, uh, you know, fundamental that we should uh, listen to. The second point, um, yeah, this is just a text. Uh, second point, the Bible is our supreme authority, not cultural pressure. Um, seven day Adventist Church should continue to be Bible-based in all matters of faith and practice. In Western society today, some within our ranks again feel pressure to be in step with the surrounding culture. We must speak meaningfully to the culture around us, but this should not lead us to disregard biblical principles and the clear teaching of Scripture on the leadership of the church. So this is under this point. And then very briefly, under uh, point C, uh, there is a domino effect of ordination. If we accept ordination of women, we may also be prone to accept other cultural or interpretative uh, practices, they say. So these are the three uh, fundamental um, uh, grounds on which their case stands, as they say. Point number two about their case. The Bible was written for everyone and we must take it as it reads. They are quoting Ellen White. I'm quoting now Ellen White here. The Bible was given for practical purposes, end of quote. Surely, they say, the matter at hand, ordination of women, regarding leadership in the church and ordination is included in this statement. Um, Second point, we must take the Bible as it reads. Opponents argue they follow the advice of Ellen White and the methods of Bible study document, which was a document voted by the church for interpretation in 1986 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And it says, they are quoting, the language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. And, and they say, we are following this. Okay, so this is a significant point. Uh, point number three in their theological case. Um, sorry, let me go again. And three. Uh, male headship in Genesis 1, chapters 1 to 3, is the fundamental theological perspective for the rest of the scripture. Paul establishes his understanding of leadership in the home and in the church based on the early chapters of Genesis. His interpretation reveals inspired insight into the meaning of these passages. The relationship among human beings are characterized, yes, by equality, they say, as well as functional differences, which we find 
in uh, Genesis chapters. Number one, on male-female equality and role distinction in Genesis 1 and 2. The first chapter of the book of Genesis reveals that both male and female were created in the image of God. They were commanded to be fruitful and to exercise dominion over all, uh, over all living uh, things. Genesis 2, they say, builds on this picture of Genesis 1, revealing a relationship between godly men and women. This is derived from the way God created Adam first, men first, and then the woman. Ellen White comments both, uh, she comments that they are both equal, yet Eve was, and now they are quoting Ellen White, that Eve was to be loved and protected by him. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 46, they quote in their argument. Opponents here significantly observe that this Ellen White statement indicates that even in the pre-fall Eden, with no threat of physical harm, one of Adam's tasks was to protect his companion. And they say, this indicates an important distinction in roles between male and female. Opponents now come to the core of the argument. What type of relationship existed between the man and the woman at this time? Because, I'm quoting again, the New Testament explains the all they say, end of quote, they turn to 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul points out that Adam and Eve's relationship before the fall was based on headship leadership principle, male headship leadership principle that existed within Godhead even before. Within the context of faith, Paul wants believers to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God, 1 Corinthians 11.3. So this is a very important point in the case. In 1 Timothy 2, referring to Genesis 2, Paul illustrates the leadership principle. Paul writes that he does not permit women to teach or to have authority. The King James Version says, usurp authority over men. For Adam was, for, uh, was formed first. And they say, you see, Paul applies the principle of male headship. The New Testament's explanation of the relationship between the man and the woman before sin clearly teaches that the man has been given the leadership function in the home and in the church. As headship and submission are principles of heaven, so on earth human beings have been created to reflect the image of God. So some, some powerful argument in the logic. Uh, after the fall, to shorten the discussion, the headship remained and was even more pronounced. God came down to question Adam after the fall, not Eve, as the responsible leader, they say. Okay? Um, point number four in there. Is, is it coming? Yes. The distinction between spiritual gifts and offices needs to be respected in the Bible. In the New Testament, we can distinguish between offices and gifts as follows. Number one, three church offices are mentioned, apostle, elder, slash, overseas, uh, and deacons. However, there are many gifts. Every believer has received at least one gift. Secondly, those who occupy offices are ordained, appointed, or chosen based on explicit, and now listen carefully, qualifications. Gifts, however, are bestowed according to the will of the Holy Spirit without any stated qualifications. This is an important point they are making. And they are giving texts. Uh, by the way, um, you can have access to the paper. I'll show you the webpage where you can find the paper. Uh, so you can check the texts. Uh, number three, uh, through every, sorry, though every believer has at least one gift, not every believer has an office. Point number four, the offices of elder and deacon are limited to husband of one wife, whereas gifts are given to both men and women. Okay? The, the, the distinction between the office and the gifts. 
Which brings me to the final uh, point, major point in the theological um, case. Biblical ordination is gender specific in the Bible. Ordination functioned throughout biblical history as a means to set apart and appoint qualified men only to a specific office of leadership. The Old Testament records the examples of Aaron and his sons being ordained, the tribe of Levi, the 70 elders, and Joshua who succeeded Moses. All these instances include men. In the New Testament, we observe the following ord ordinations. Jesus ordains 12 apostles, 70 disciples. Furthermore, the New Testament records the ordination of the seven. The New Testament epistles then record the ordination of Barnabas, Paul, Timothy, and elders. All these are gender-specific ordinations, they say. Thus, the biblical evidence of ordination points to men only being ordained to leadership, offices, and roles. In short, ordination is a setting apart of, they say, men to a sacred office of leadership in the church. Women may fulfill many valuable roles, however, the biblical qualifications for overseeing, for, uh, for overseeing leadership, uh, they include uh, the gender specification. Okay? It's the, the husband of one wife qualification. So this is the theological case, and I hope I did the justice in a nutshell to uh, the biblical force, the, the theological force, how they are present in the case. And many of these points, by the way, have not been clarified until Tosk. Tosk has really clarified some of these points. Uh, this brings me to um, my point two on the opponents, which is their use of texts. Now, these texts have been read today and discussed, so let me just very briefly um, comment on uh, the text you see in bold, which is 1 Timothy 2, 1 Corinthians 14, and 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. Um, even though those texts that are discussed by, by opponents are more than these. Now, the key point is this. For opponents, none of these key passages are problematic, I'm quoting, are problematic, obscure, or painfully puzzling, they say. All are written in clear prose, and do not contain typological, figurative, symbolic, or poetic language, which means that they are not difficult to understand. They say it doesn't take a scholar to interpret them. All of these passages are, they say, I'm, I'm quoting again, to be interpreted literally unless the context clearly indicates otherwise. So that's the um, outlook right away as they approach these texts. 1 Timothy 2, opponents appeal to this text as the backbone text uh, of their case, of the debate. This is at the center of, uh, of their case. Uh, point number one, universal application and permanent validity of the uh, text. Um, first Timothy, for opponents, um, lies for opponents, in the fact that this letter, the significance of it lies for opponents in the fact that this letter presents principles with permanent validity and universal application. Verses 11 and 12, which say that women should learn in quietness and submission, mean that women should not be authoritative teachers in the church. Women can, however, teach specific groups of young men, they say, and individuals, but never pastor or elder and bishop. Let me just say a, a footnote here. Even this position, this was taken from uh, the books published before the Tosk. The Tosk has moved on on, on this, and uh, I'll say something about uh, um, the groups that women can teach it has been specified a little bit more. I'll say more at the end about this. First Corinthians 14. The key verse in this passage for opponents is the verse 34. For they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate, as even the law says. 1 Corinthians 14, 34. While the text does not provide specific clues, it is nevertheless clear that the concept of headship is the basic injunction, they say. The text is thus interpreted literally from the theological perspective of creation, headship principle. Um, 1 Timothy 3, uh, 1 to 7. For opponents, this is another backbone text. It establishes the criteria or qualifications for holding 
the office of elder slash pastor. Two main arguments are brought up here. The meaning of verse, of verse 2, which needs to be read literally, and secondly, the universal uh, re relevance of the passage. Uh, now the overseer must be about reproach, the husband of but one wife. That's verse 2. Opponents here argue that the main lesson of the verse is to teach that an elder should be a man. And then opponents stress that this applies across ages and regions and geography. So it has universal application. Concerning the text of Galatians 3.28, opponents say that this text does not deal with the problem of church organization, but with salvation, and hence is not relevant for the discussion. Okay, as the, as the proponents say. So this is the um, theological case, their approach to texts, very briefly, because you had a discussion before. And now the question is this, uh, what can we learn from their approach? Well, I call it uh, the, their thinking. Number one, opponents' thinking is based on, I think it's obvious, on literal reading of New Testament passages, which retrospectively provide a vantage point for understanding Genesis 1 to 3. The literal reading of opponents means interpreting scripture in its plain, natural, and normal sense, just as one would interpret the language today. Since scripture should be understood literally, there is no space for suggesting that one should look for principles, or plot, or trajectory, or plot line. These terms are rejected by opponents. Um, they look for direct and obvious meaning. The second point here is the, the emphasis on universal applicability of every passage of scripture to the present situation. Uh, I think this was established. Point number three, uh, opponents' reading is also characterized by assumption that scripture is clear or plain concerning the question of women's ordination. The interpreter needs to follow the plain meaning of passages. I think this in a nutshell uh, presents the, the, the basic elements uh, of the hermeneutical uh, thinking. However, it may be helpful just to briefly indicate what is behind this approach. And this is where it gets really interesting. Why do opponents say that scripture is plain in its meaning? Why do they insist that scripture is clear and should be understood as normal discourse is understood? Why do they propose that scripture has universal application and that the Bible is not culturally accommodated or conditioned? Now, if you want the long answer, that's in my book. Um, the, with the evidence, but the short answer in two paragraphs is this. Opponents say that scripture came to us in the language of the reader, that God gave scripture in the language of the ancient or modern reader. Why? It becomes important for the whole structure of opponents' thought what they believe or assume about how inspiration and language works. For opponents, God inspired the Bible in such a way that inspiration assured objective and uncontaminated transmission of God's ideas into human language. In other words, God controlled the process of Bible inspiration so tightly that no cultural, no personal deficiencies were allowed to come into the text. This they often refer to as full inspiration the Bible is fully inspired, meaning what God wanted is in the text and you read it of the text. Um, thus opponents' view of the nature of Scripture, its language can be described as immediate or unmediated. There is no mediation. God tells this to the prophet and he writes it down and there is no influence, personal or cultural, on the text unmediated by the author of culture. Immediacy in inspiration assured that we have the Bible exactly as God intended without accommodation from the author or his culture. And this is a significant assumption in the thinking of opponents, which then leads to literal reading. If it is 
inspired immediately, directly, you read directly. That's the point. So, I mean, the case is not illogical. It's very logical, the case of opponents. If the nature of the Bible is like that, then it should be read in a normal way, literally, and one should expect that the meaning is plain and obvious. It doesn't take a scholar, as they say, to interpret the Bible. Okay? I hope, you know, those of you who, who are opponents, you, you hear what I'm saying and you agree. So, this is the case of the opponents. Okay? In a nutshell, five points very briefly, but if you want the paper, I'll, I'll give you the web page where you can go and read your heart's content. Uh, so, let's now turn to, uh, to the case of... Uh, oh, sorry, I should have maybe show, showed you some of these slides, but anyway, okay, I just repeat what I said. So, the case of the, um, the thinking and the case of the uh, proponents of women's ordination. Now, again, I will use four points, just kind of four pillars to say these are the four, four pillars on which their case stands, to make it simple. Uh, point number one. Um, okay, so you have the point number two as well, they, they, but uh, anyway. Point number one, Adam and Eve's equality in Genesis 1 and 2 is the fundamental interpretative perspective for the rest of the Bible. So you can see right away the question of how Genesis 1 and 2 is approached makes a big difference. Both men and women are created in the divine image, they say. Uh, although the terms male and female do connotate sexual, biological, and other differences, both men and women are commanded equally and without any distinction to have dominion, not of one over the other, but both together over the rest of God's creation. There is absence of any hierarchy of men over women. The question of the priority of Adam, that man is created first before the woman, may suggest to some that Adam was to have authority over Eve, they say. But contextually, this is not the case. Woman is created as the climax of the creation story. The movement in the text is from incompleteness to completeness, not first and second, the kind of priority thing. Adam's priority means that the creation of humans was not yet completed. Um, the question of the creation of Eve from Adam's rib, they say this, the derivation of Eve from Adam points to their equality. He was created from Adam's side, not from his head or foot, to show that she was to stand by his side as an equal, they say. The term helper, that she was created as a helper for him. In the original, they say, does not de denote a subordinate helper or assistant, simply points to a beneficial relationship. Ellen White writes, they are quoting Ellen White here, and they say, when God created Eve, he designed that she should possess neither inferiority nor superiority to the man, but that in all things, and this is in the italics, but that in all things she should be his equal. End of quote from Ellen White. Um, Adam and Eve after the fall, still on, the, still on Genesis, on the issue of Adam and Eve's equality, the proponents say, the submission of the wife to the husband occurred after the fall not before, after the fall of Adam and Eve. Um, he will rule over you, Genesis 3.16. This relationship is not a creation ordinance, but comes as a result of sin. Genesis 3.16 is limited to the husband-wife relationship and therefore does not involve a general subordination of women to men or universal headship of men over women. I think it's a significant point the proponents are making here. So even here, the context is husband-wife. Just as the end of chapter 2, Genesis, they say, ends with husband-wife context. You have the fall and the, and the image then that he shall rule over you in the context of Adam and Eve being husband and wife. That's the argument. Point number two, you see it um, on the screen now. 
mission of God becomes the main biblical framework for ministry, the main driver for the church. In the Old Testament, ministry and mission defines the main reason for Israel's Old Testament church's existence. The primary reason for choosing patriarchs and later Israel was the advancement of God's mission. Importantly, the Bible never indicates that women's leadership role was an ex exception to male leadership. There is no such indication, explicit, explicit indication in the Old Testament, they say. In the New Testament, the church is understood by the prominent metaphor of body of Christ. This metaphor is framed in the context or within the context of spiritual gifts. And Paul uses this language to indicate that in such community, distinction of race, class, culture, or gender are secondary to the central alliance to Christ and his mission in the world. Mission is the ruling theological metaphor. That's the second pillar in their case. Pillar number three in their case. And, and they lead from one to another if you listen carefully now, the doctrine of spiritual gifts defines how ministry operates in the New Testament. The Pentecost, um, the Pentecost event in Acts 2 is the defining moment of church's mission, they say. In this sense, spiritual gifts, charismata, become the fuel that propels the mission engine of God, of church. There are several implications of this for, uh, for our understanding, they say. Number one, gifts of the Spirit are necessary for the functioning of the mission. Secondly, spiritual gifts indicate the diversity. Number three, spiritual, uh, uh, the Spirit bestows gifts upon all believers, regardless of race or gender or social status. And number four, spiritual uh, gifting indicates that there cannot be any foundational difference between laity and clergy. Any form of clericalism is opposed to the basic concept of spiritual gifts. And the final pillar in their case, leading to this one. Specialized leadership ministries are based on spiritual gifts, not unique qualifications. The New Testament, and, and you can see how one leads to another, this is a complete argument once again. The, the New Testament sees no dichotomy between the gifts and the structure. For this reason, the New Testament also supports the idea of specialized ministries, yes, pastoral, evangelistic, apostolic, teaching ministries, etc., to equip uh, and edify the members. The appointment of such people is firmly based, however, on their spiritual giftedness to equip members for the mission of God once again. It is, uh, in all cases, it is God who is the initiator of the call and the mission. As Adventists, we have recognized that women can serve as pastors and teachers, proponents say, and since these gifts are gender inclusive, the biblical logic then mandates that we also consider them as elders and overseers. These different ministries were not formal offices, but functions given by the Spirit. Important point now, listen. The word office, that is used in opponent's case quite strongly. Uh, the word office, in fact, does not even appear in the New Testament or in the Bible. So one cannot, as opponents do, the proponents say, speak about the office of elder, the office of uh, apostle. There is no such thing in the New Testament. This raises the question of qualification lists, which is a prominent argument in opponents' case. So it raises the question of qualifications lists as they relate to the function of elder and deacon, as mentioned in 1 Timothy 3, for example, uh, verses 1 to 13. What is the function of these uh, qualification lists, they ask. Do they add new criteria for believers to be appointed to specific ministries of elder, overseer, or deacon? Proponents of women's ordination argue they do not, for several reasons, add extra layer of qualification. The first reason, they say, is, or would be, how Paul begins the passage by saying in 1 Timothy 3, 1, 
if anyone, not if a man desires. The Greek uses the word tis. If anyone aspires to a position of oversight. He doesn't say if a man aspires, as some translations do it. Uh, this means that Paul does not begin with gender limitation, proponents say. Secondly, although the qualifications are in the masculine language then, it does not exclude women from serving in these ministries any more than Ten Commandments is using masculine language and would exclude women from obedience to the commandments. For example, Exodus 20, 17 is a masculine language, yet also it applies to women, right? What one has to understand, they say, is that the use of masculine language was a very common device in the ancient world. But such language did not imply that the other gender was excluded from the discussion. I think it's an important point they are making. Um, it is also not surprising that many of the qualifications, this is point number three concerning the lists in 1 Timothy 3, that many of these qualifications are in reality the same as those expected of all Christians. They are not gender exclusive. They describe general moral attributes, as in the case of a husband of one wife, as in 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 12. In both cases, the phrase is rather, they say, it is a Greek, how the Greek goes, a one woman man, the Greek says. A one woman man. And they say it indicates that Paul had in mind sexual purity as requirement rather than gender qualification. So Paul uses gender language in specific situations to communicate principles that are relevant for men and women in leadership ministries. Hence, Conclusion today, case, any person who has received and developed the required gifts of the Spirit can be used by him in any position in the church. This is how they end the argument, okay? The texts. Um, and many of these points have really been clarified in Tosk, I, I can tell you. I mean, I went through um, over the seven years of that, doing my PhD, all arguments that I could find in any published books or articles uh, in our church, and, and these arguments were not laid down like this, I can tell you. So the text, the use of the text, perhaps I only mentioned Galatians 3. It was brought up here, but I'll just mention what is the, the latest understanding of the proponents on this. At the first glance, um, the text in Galatians says nothing about the question of ordination of women. Proponents readily admit this, yet the implications, they say, of Galatians 3, 38, sorry, 28, have direct consequences to the question of gender equality in ministry. Um, in other words, proponents here employ the terminology of vertical and horizontal salvation in, um, uh, in order to highlight relational and practical consequences of uh, Christ's salvation. Readers of the text must go beyond the God-man vertical oneness to discuss horizontal human-human oneness, if it is to be taken seriously, they say. Proponents' approach uh, is visibly different from opponents here, because proponents argue here, and this is a key point, because proponents approach these texts, especially Galatians 3, uh, 28, from the perspective of creation, fall, restoration. And they say, when properly understood in the context of the big picture of the Bible, the perfection, fall, restoration picture, Galatians 3, 26, 29, becomes Magna Carta of true biblical equality that should be applied on God-man level, but also human-human level. So perfection, good picture Genesis 1, fall Genesis 3, restoration in Jesus. Let's apply, they say. Um, okay, um, I have something here on 1 Timothy 2, but we discussed this. I'm not so sure I want to go into this one. Um, I can just jump over this. Um, let me just say about 1 Timothy 2 here, one point. 
that they point out uh, in their discussion, and this is a new point that, that was clarified in Tosk. Um, proponents argue that Paul's statement in 1 Timothy 2 where women should be silent, right? I should not teach, sorry, and should be silent and not teach. In 1 Timothy 2 they say it's not universal because of his choice of Greek word for authority. They point out that Paul uses the term autrentein in Greek, which is only used at this place and nowhere else. It refers to domineering and controlling form of behavior of somebody. They say this, um, it does not mean, as opponents say, exercising authority, or as most translations indeed have it. If Paul, in fact, wanted to lay down a more general and universal rule of for women being barred from exercising spiritual authority over men in the church, he would have used a much more common general Greek term, uh, which is exousia. This was a very common term, but he goes for a one-time word, indicating as a unique uh, problem in this church describing a dominating relationship. So this is not an argument just from cultural history they are bringing in, but they are saying textually, Paul is uh, uh, choosing his words very carefully. Uh, thus they conclude, um, the women, sorry, uh, the women in Ephesus were not fit to teach, not because they were women, but because they had been or were being deceived by false teachers, just as Eve had been deceived by the alluring words of the serpent. And uh, again, uh, on 1 Corinthians 14, I think points have been made, so I'll just jump over here on this one uh, and the proponent's case. Now, where does this take us then? They're thinking. For proponents, the overall context of the passage, the context of the passage within the book, and the context of the book within the Bible is an important interpretative rule. While opponent's reading is more direct, literalistic, focused on smaller portions, uh, the proponent's reading is a little bit more contextual and indirect. In other words, proponent's interpretation of scripture is looking for underlying larger perspectives, sometimes called principles or plot or trajectories. I have indicated that this kind of approach is rejected by opponents who emphasize plainness and obviousness of meaning. I have termed proponents' overall context reading as principle-based reading. So principle-based reading is different from literalistic reading of opponents. I think this is something where simply we have different strategies. Um, secondly, um, so contextual reading, and point number two, uh, there is a careful exegetical and semantic analysis of the text uh, that, uh, that proponents follow. They emphasize that interpretation needs to be objective and scientific, and there are precise rules of how one goes about exegesis interpretation. And they have a long list of these rules, not that opponents don't have it, they have it as well, but the kind of directness is much more stronger in an opponent's case. Um, point number three, uh, about their thinking, the cultural historical interpretation. Another significant point of the departure from opponent's reading is that proponents widely use the cultural and historical realities to interpret the passage under consideration. Opponents, on the other hand, are not so ready to use such methods. Nonetheless, for proponents, uncovering the pristine historical situation is fundamental for uncovering the first meaning of the passage. For proponents, various literary styles and genres, social customs, grammar, are evidences of a historical cultural reality of scripture, which has to be followed. And now again, the significant thing is, what is behind these reading habits of proponents? Why do they follow these and not the same procedures as opponents? Why such a difference? Once again, we have to come back to the question of inspiration and language. Proponents, um, here we go, uh, 
proponents have indeed very different conception of inspiration of scripture and how language of scripture works than, than opponents do. For them, inspiration is not an unmediated process through which God inspires the authors, but instead it is very much a mediated process. In other words, the Bible authors shape the message by their personality and even by the cultural limitations. So the language of the Bible, following on the logic, so the language of the Bible is not, let me use the word, uncontaminated or sterile like in the case of opponents because the Bible is indeed accommodated to the level of the author's culture and understanding. One must consider cultural and historical matters in order to properly interpret the Bible. I can put this differently for the proponent's case. Um, for proponents, language according to proponents is an imperfect medium of communication, while for opponents it is a perfect vehicle of meaning. How do you even address these issues? Because it is imperfect. The reading is also less direct or literalistic and more principle-based than in the case of opponents. And I think this is in a nutshell the case of um, proponents. Now, this is where we are. As I told you, the church said, well, we just simply don't agree on these issues. The most interesting part of my presentation, how much time do I have, Pastor? Ten more minutes, excellent. I need ten more minutes, that, that, that's all I need. So, this is the most interesting part, and maybe even for the day, the future of the debate. So, where does it leave our church? Where does it leave people like you? People like us, pastors. Um, what does it reveal about our thinking and the use of the Bible? What will happen now after 2015? And, and would, in fact, any vote one way or the other, convince people to think respect, uh, respectfully about the opinion and the practices of the other side. So, uh, my uh, first section, the administrative options and their implications. Um, given the two different theological positions, two different interpretative models, and two different models of inspiration and how scripture is understood, both camps also propose their own solutions. Here they are, the opponent's solution. To reaffirm, this is the opponent's practical solution, I should say. To reaffirm and encourage with public recognition and licensure women whom God has called to gospel work. To provide enhanced access to educational opportunities for women in gospel work and ensure fair and just treatment upon their placement in ministry. I mean, these are not controversial, the first several ones. Point number three, to promote the greater development of various lines of ministry for women according to their spiritual gifts, including, but not limited to personal and public evangelism, teaching, preaching, ministering to families, counseling, medical missionary work, departmental leadership, etc. While increasing opportunities for women in ministry, we also recommend that the church, and now these are controversial ones, the four and five, retain the scriptural practice of ordaining slash commissioning only qualified men to the office of pastor slash minister throughout the world church in harmony with the consistent example of Christ, the apostles, and the Adventist pioneers. And five, this is the most controversial of all, Return, return to the biblical practice of electing and ordaining only men to the office of local elder throughout the world church, while providing for women to serve as an unordained church leaders under certain circumstances. Okay? I think it's coherent with the, with the stance they have. Here is the proponents. Now, I'll discuss in a second what it would, would cause in the church. But uh, here is the proponent's practical suggestion where they want to go. Um, yes. 
Therefore, because we accept the Bible's call to give witness to God's impartiality and believe that this unity, this is an interesting one, they believe that this unity and fragmentation will be the inevitable result of enforcing only one perspective in all regions, we propose that. Each entity responsible for calling pastors be authorized to choose either to have only men as ordained pastors or to have both men and women as ordained pastors. And they say this choice will be protected by relevant documents. Okay? Point number two, the union at which organizational level decisions for ordination have historically been made in the Seventh-day Adventist Church be enabled by its division to make the decision as to whether to approve the ordination of both men and women to gospel ministry. This is what it is. So let the fields decide. Okay? Since we have no agreement, let the fields decide. Now, my commentary. The fundamental choice thus is between regional variance and non-variance option. Do you allow regions to go to do this and that or not? That's the issue. But it, doesn't add, it does not end here. Really, if the church decides to accept the practical position of opponents, the non-variance is not where it ends. There will have to be further actions taken to change the current practice of the church in ordaining women elders, as they say, point five of the proposition. Women pastoral duties, their teaching theology, Bible, you know, their teaching theology and Bible at our seminaries and schools, they propose, for example, in one of the papers at Tosk, it was clearly said that women should not teach men on matters of doctrine, not just ordained men, any men. How do you begin to apply this? This is a tough one. And when, when, when this person was questioned, when the case was questioned in Tosk, I'm afraid the answers were not complete. Um, um, so this option, option five of the, of the opponents to undo ordinations of uh, women elders, it appears to reverse the direction in which the church has so far moved and it carries with it potentially far-reaching consequences for how we operate today. You can appreciate that. Uh, on the other hand, the option of proponents which calls for regional sensitivity is also fraught with potential complications regarding our church practice. New rules and policies will have to be defined and accepted by the world church which will define the parameters within which ordained women will operate in regions which will not authorize such right. The question raised here. But this option was supported. This option, the practical suggestion of the proponents, was supported by two-thirds majority in the Tosk. And let me tell you this, most Tosk members were Bible scholars and top church administrators, including many GC officers. After the GC's annual council, the motion which sends uh, to the floor, uh, it sends to the floor the following question. So you had the question before, uh, and um, very briefly, after your prayerful study on ordination from the Bible, the writings of Ellen White and the reports of the study commissions, this is to the delegates, and after your careful consideration of what is best for the church and the fulfillment of its mission, is it acceptable for division executive committees, as they may deem it appropriate, in the territories to make provision for the ordination of women to the gospel ministry, yes or no? As you can see, do you allow regional variance or not? That is only the question. All appears to be open, but it's not quite the case. In fact, the question is a very clever question because it takes away from the hands of the delegates the decision on theology and only asks them to grant or not to grant the main church regional entities, divisions, the right to decide how to handle this issue. The question is clever, but it's also deeply spiritual because in effect, it asks the delegates, 
do you trust your brothers in Africa or Europe or Asia or America to make responsible decisions concerning ordination of women? It is a question of humility. In fact, just think through the implications, as Daniel Duda already mentioned this, just think through the implications if the delegates will express a no vote. It seems to me that in that case, the delegates will express openly their distrust towards divisions which see this matter differently. In effect, they will say to individual divisions, we don't trust you. In the face of clear hermeneutical and theological divide, the GC thinks the ordination question needs to be now handled administratively and spiritually. Since it is not a fundamental beliefs issue, this question is not part of our fundamental beliefs. It is clear that a GC vote on theology of ordination would be deeply explosive and deeply dividing. And this is what they want to avoid. Hence, the question is, let the, division, uh, let, let, uh, the divisions decide yes or no. Do you trust them to make the right administrative decisions or not? This is the choice before the church. Um, so what happens if the church votes down the motion and says no? Firstly, it will be a vote of no trust in the divisions. But more pragmatically, parts of the world that are against the ordination of women and had no plans will continue as usual. Nothing will change for them. Parts of the world where they are open to ordination of women will have to make a choice. Either they can follow in the same way as before and wait till another motion, administrative motion, will appear at the GC for regional variance, or they can do the opposite, ignore the delegates' vote of distrust and to follow with their conviction because, because that was not under the vote. Their conviction was not, their uh, case was not under the vote. Or, I'm sure they will call it rebellion, or they can accept the GC's decision but stop ordinations altogether and follow a different biblical model of commissioning. I don't think the issue can be brought back to the GC as a theological issue, not after the Tusk. But it could be brought back, and certainly will be, if the question in 2015 is voted down as an administrative motion. If, however, the question is answered with the majority yes, then the divisions which oppose ordination of women will still continue as before but the fields that are open to such practice will be given freedom to grant their individual unions power to decide if the time to ordain women in the territory has come. But a yes vote on the spiritual level will certainly send out a very positive message. We trust you that you will handle this matter responsibly. Will a yes vote damage the unity of the church? Interestingly, a no vote has now the potential of damaging the unity of the church much more than a yes vote, strangely enough. Especially damaging the spiritual unity, or trust, I should say. It's a fact, what I'm telling you, I'm not telling you just my analysis here, but I'm telling you what I have heard from division leaders of the divisions who oppose women's ordination, they acknowledge this, and they say that it's deeply troubling if it's a no vote even though they are against ordination. Now, uh, let me finish, conclude five minutes. About Luther, Swingley, and Adventists. This is the most interesting, this should wake you up. The two big giants of uh, the European reformations, Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, and their clash on one matter, the Lord's Supper, can provide to us an interesting final lesson. The controversy broke out between the two Reformation regions, the South Swiss Reformation and the North German. The Swiss division, if you wish, has, uh, uh, was led by Zwingli, Martin Bucer, uh, Johann Wecolampadius, for example. The North division was led by Luther, 
and Philip Melanchthon. The controversy concerned a simple matter, at least on the surface. What did Jesus mean when he said? See the text over there? And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Matthew 26, 26. Now, Martin Luther said, it is obvious, the text is plain. He means, Jesus means, what, you know, um, the text says. He means that when the believers take the consecrated bread of the Lord's Supper, it is indeed Jesus' body. Jesus said it. This is my body. And this is the obvious meaning of the text. Zwingli comes in and he says, the text may be simple, but its meaning is not so obvious. When Jesus says, this is my body, what he really means is that this signifies my body. The natural meaning of the text is not the plain meaning in this case, he says. So, they could not agree. This situation caused massive disunity between the two Reformation regions and threatened to slow down the progress of the Reformation cause and Protestantism in Europe, in fact. After all, the article of the Lord's Supper was such a fundamental Christian article, right? How could the biggest giants of Christianity at the time not get agreed on a simple statement? And this was causing pain in the Protestant body. So they said, let's come together and talk it through. And so they called their own Tosk version of meetings, except they did call it colloquy. Um, and they met in October 1529 in Marburg for four days in Germany. And the, uh, the big names from both sides were there. During the initial dialogue, Zwingli and Luther were split up and assigned initial meetings with uh, different people from opposing camps. Luther and Oecolampadius were paired and sent to begin talks while Zwingli and Melanchthon, uh, Melanchthon went, were paired the first day. The following day, Zwingli met with Luther. Luther famously carved into the desk the Latin word, hoc es corpus meum, this is my body in English. And then he covered this inscription with a velvet cloth. When they came to the reasons, Zwingli and Luther, face to face, eye to eye, um, when they came to the reasons why they interpret the text as, as they do, famously Luther uncovered the cloth and said, because it says it here, hoc es corpus meum, this is my body, so it must be Christ's physical body. What, what more do you need? This was his primary text. But Zwingli appealed to contextual reading. And he said, didn't you read in John 6, 63, the flesh is of no avail? Contextual reading. The discussion continued until uh, uh, adjourning in the night, for the night being resumed the following morning. They prepared 15 articles. 14 of which were affirmed by both parties. The 15th on the subject of the Lord's Supper expressed a mutual rejection of the Catholic Mass, but stated this. At the present time, at the present we are not agreed as to whether the true body and blood of Christ are bodily present in the bread and wine. They agree to disagree. The point of all this is not only to notice the obvious similarity with our Adventist dilemma, but also the way both Reformation centers thought theologically and interpretatively. Luther, all his life, inclined to read the Bible literally. He was a literalist. His mode of thinking was direct, was plain. Zwingli, on the other hand, was a man of less direct reading and thinking. He realized the plain meaning is not always the natural meaning of the text. He was able to reason more symbolically and principally. There is a fundamental difference in the way both people, and for that matter, both Reformation wings thought. And here is my point. 
the wiring of Luther and Swingley was different. And so the reading of a simple passage was also different. They went into the graves with their patterns of thinking and interpretation. Their controversy has a massive lesson for us. There is something on a deeper level within us that makes us think as we do. I don't mean culture. I don't mean upbringing now. All this applies. But still on a deeper level, there is something that makes us to think in a certain way. We use language more directly or more symbolically. And there is probably not a simple solution when we come together to talk, to see things the same way. And um, this is why we have no choice as the Adventists before the GC and after the GC, but to learn to live with the thorn in our Adventist flesh, with humility and charity. After all, both men are described by Ellen White as Christian giants who were mightily used by God in their own time. Despite their differences and various thinking patterns, God used them and saved them. There is a lesson for us Adventists, and I hope we can see the point. And so as for Luther or Zwingli, the only way to deal with the situation at the time with Protestantism and the Reformation was accepting one another with humility. And so maybe for us, the only way to move forward together will have to be the same as for Luther and Zwingli, a way of humility, accepting that we don't have the unity on this matter and, allow, and allowing my fellow brothers and sisters to do their work with free conscience where they live. Bounding the conscience of one group would be a way to arrogance and rejection, not a way of Christ, I would put to you. Thank you. <laughs>